the um no, oh good no. this time it started mm -hmm. so chaos or civilization and uh we got to hear his successor uh, well i'll just back up this great reformer was called the bob the gate is what it means in 1845 he mistakenly proclaimed himself to have arrived at perfection when he declared i am the primal point from which have been generated all created things he he certainly was not a perfected man as there is no record of his possessing such divine authority for his announcement of divine right, he was punished and shot, and his enthusiastic and faithful followers were condemned to the most atrocious tortures by Allah-fearing Muslims for daring to recognize a great saint in the Bab and also his mission. His successor, Baha'u'llah, Another striking spiritual personality who founded the Baha'i movement announced that God would, in this age, fulfill his ancient promise to mankind and that by his intervention, the hearts of men would be so swiftly and completely changed that within this 20th century, universal peace would be attained and all nations would unite in founding a new world. For so he said, soon the present day order be rolled up, soon will the present day order be rolled up and a new one spread out in its stead. Spiritually advanced personalities who proclaim their godhood and declare their mission as avatar or messiah can mistake their spiritual identity. Such men have undoubtedly reached great heights in spiritual endeavor, but they fall short of the standards of the great world avatars who have the supreme direction of the universe. The new world savior of our age will be one who can prove his spiritual authority to humanity by causing the universal descent of the Holy Spirit to change men's hearts on a worldwide scale. This, the privileged few who will receive enlightenment and attain to all knowledge will be able to look back in time to the days of Adam and before that, to when they were strange ape-like men and before that, to when they were the elephant, the dog and the horse and before that, to when they were some amphibious reptile crawling out of the primeval slime. And before that, they will be able to see millions of worlds in which they lived and be able to sing of the millions of Christ. Like the Guru Nanak who sang, at his throne, at his throne a million prophets and, a, and millions of Brahmas and Vishnus and Shivas and millions upon millions of Ramas and millions of wayfarers, each clad in a different garb. He, the Lord of all, is one, the chief of all lords. He is the creator of all that is. He is beyond conception and speech. His qualities are unnumbered and endless. In the second advent, we remember the words of Jesus. And then, if any man shall say unto you, here is Christ, or lo, he is there, believe him not. But in those days, then, shall they see the Son of Man coming in the clouds of heaven with power and great glory, and he shall send his angels. And they shall gather together his elect from the four winds, from the uttermost part of heaven. Mer Baba has interpreted this as follows. The gathering of the elect refers to the reincarnation and final assembling of his close disciples and followers at the time of his second coming. 
It is wrong to associate the second coming with the imprisonment of Satan and the thousand years of peace or with a literal interpretation of the last day of judgment. When the Christ descends through the clouds, that is, through the higher spheres of consciousness, he will bring with him to earth infinite goodness, wisdom, power, and love, and also the signs and experiences of the six lower planes. This will be the great manifestation of the, of the Christ consciousness, which will bring in the new dispensation. Can the quote-unquote tribulation be anything but Armageddon? to be followed by the second advent. And there shall be signs in the sun and in the moon and in the stars and upon the earth, distress of state of nations with perplexity, the sea and the waves roaring, men's hearts failing them for fear and for looking after those things which are coming on the earth for the powers of heaven shall be shaken. And then shall they see the Son of Man coming in a cloud with power and great glory. And when these things begin to come to pass, then look up and lift up your heads, for your redemption draweth nigh. That's uh, in Luke chapter 21, verses 25, 28. Um, Gloria, could you unmute and continue, please? Yes. Are we not reaping what we have sown in materialistic greed and intellectual superiority? Few seem to have realized the significance of the last two words, and those who have seemed powerless to influence the world. Even now, if all the peoples of the earth were to go down on their knees in prayer, penance, and fasting, would not the coming of evil be avoided? For we, capital, can shape our own destiny. How collective prayer can change a nation is proved by the miraculous appearance of, quote unquote, Our Lady of Fatima to the little peasant children in Portugal in 1917. In the third year of the First World War, Pope Benedict XV issued an earnest appeal for a crusade of prayer on the 5th of May to Our Lady Mediatrix of Graces for the purpose of ending a war which threatened to engulf civilization. On the 13th of May, the Virgin Mary appeared to three children tending their sheep of the village of Cove da Iris. Quote, unquote, the lady paid a number of visits to the children on the 13th of each month, the crowds watching The miraculous event numbered some 60,000 persons or more at the last appearance when the quote unquote miracle of the dancing song took place. The Lady of the Rosary warned the people that they must not continue to offend her son who had been so deeply offended. She made several prophecies which came true when the communist revolution was launched in Russia with all these atheists, it, do, it did not affect Portugal, and Portugal escaped the horrors of civil war which afflicted her neighbor, Spain. The whole of Portugal's spiritual life was affected by the amazing heavenly visitation of the Virgin. Such was the miracle of Our Lady's divine intervention. We are individually and collectively responsible because we, ourselves, built up our own thoughts, forms, or mental impressions, and are therefore responsible for them. Those, these forms reflect our moods, which are in accordance with our thinking. If we think harmoniously and constructively, our thought forms support us in the right direction. But on the contrary, we think unharmoniously and throw evil and malicious impression of hate and vengeance into the ether, we create evil entities which react adversely on ourselves and our environment. Quote, unquote, as above, so below. 
the own spiritual reactions of a materialistic civilization full of hates and fears have created billions of evil influences in the semi-subtle spheres. These have been formed by individuals and groups. The repercussion in malevolent thought forms is now causing the tragic denouement coming upon the earth at large. Is it any wonder that we must have capital, some form of divine intervention? The world crisis grows deeper and deeper and the despairing cry of humanity grows louder and louder till it will reach the very gates of heaven itself. In the Lord's song in the Gita, the blessed Lord Krishna spake unto Arjuna and he said, Good. Whenever virtue is on the decline and the resurgence of evil and injustice in the world is occurring, I, the avatar, take on human form for the establishment of righteousness and the destructions, destruction of the evil doer. I am born from age to age, end quote. Then turning to Arjuna, the blessed Lord revealed himself in all his glory. Then fell Arjuna on his knees and covered his face. Quote, Lord, I see, I see, end quote. When man has sunk so low and he can sink no lower, when his intellectual powers and scientific pride are humble in the dust, then will he see and the masters will act. The floodgates of the seven plain the, sorry, the floodgates and the seven planes of heaven will be unlocked. A miraculous outpouring of divine love will deluge humanity, flooding every corner of the human heart, giving rise to a tremendous and universal upliftment, which will affect the whole universe. This will be the awakening of the heart chakra on a cosmic scale. We conclude this book by giving Mayor's Baba Long's address to a recent gathering of his workers in India. It is important being the very first time that the master had ever given out more than short messages. His communication is as follows, quote, this is, this is no political or social meeting. The meeting for which you have all assembled here and which is the first of its kind that I am holding in these 60 years of my life is for the divine cause. This assemblage reminds me of former meetings during my previous incarnations. Then the circumstances were different, but since eternity, the same God incarnate has been presiding over such meetings for the same cause, the divine cause. Thus never has it been more truly said more truly said that in the spiritual cause that history repeats itself, end quote. Quote, even if this meeting were to take all night for what I have to say, I would not mind because this one night would be worth millions of nights if you all honestly live up, live up to and act according to what I wish from my real workers. The apostles and the quote and quote as a Hava, who worked for the divine cause, did my work at the very cost of life itself. So heed my words most attentively. End quote. Quote. My personally contacting the masses in India through vast darshan programs has been sufficient for my work. The presentation of addresses and the giving of messages mean nothing on the actual spiritual path. I tell you with divine authority that chanting my party, performing my puja, garlanding me, offering me fruits and sweets, are bowing down to me in themselves mean absolutely nothing. It is a waste of money to spend on garlands, fruits and sweets, and bowing down to me for the conventional puja and a sheer waste of breath and energy merely to chant my arti. From time eternal, gods have been performing my real puja, capitals. What I want from all my lovers is real, unadulterated love. 
And from my genuine workers, I expect real work done and quotes. I also want, quote, I also want to draw your attention to the fact that miracles experienced by my devotees and admirers, both in the East and in the West, have been attributed to me. On the basis of my divine honesty, I tell you that in this incarnation, I have not, up until now, consciously performed a single miracle. Whenever a miracle has been attributed to me, it was always been news to me. What I wish to emphasize is that by attributing such miracles to me, people cheapen and lower my status as the highest of the high. But today, I do say this, that the moment I break my silence and utter the original word, the first and last miracle of Baba will be performed. And when I perform that miracle, I shall not rise the dead, but shall make those who live for the world dead but shall make those who live for the world dead to the world and live in God. I shall not give sight to the blind, but make people blind to illusion and make them see God as reality." End quote. Thank you, Gloria. Uh, Marian, could you unmute please and continue? Yes. I have had enough of this alphabet board and my silence. I must break my silence soon. And when I do, all will come to know of it. Those who have come in contact with me will have a glimpse of me. When the powerhouse is switched on, there will be light wherever the electric bulbs are connected with it, provided these bulbs are not fused. Where the bulbs are of high candle power, the light will be considerable. Where a bulb is fused, there will be no light. Love me wholeheartedly. The time for the powerhouse to be switched on is so near that the only thing which will count now is love. This is why I have been telling you all to love me more and more. Love me, love me, love me and then you will find me. From you, I want no surrender, no mind, no body, no possessions, only love. I know that you, big and small, rich and poor, have done your best to work for the divine cause. And I say with happiness that you have tried to express your love for me by spreading my messages of love to the masses. But I feel that something deep down is very wrong and that you have not clearly understood how my work should be approached. It is natural that amongst workers of any cause, be it political, social, or spiritual, there are bound to be differences of opinion. These differences of opinion and feelings of competition and jealousy lead to the breakdown of the very basis of work. I will now explain to you how you should work. First of all, bear in mind that you should not seek appreciation from me or from others. Though this may seem easy, it is very difficult to put into practice. Remember that work in itself is its own appreciation. The moment you seek appreciation, the work is undone. Therefore, seek not any appreciation for the work you do for me. Secondly, do not count upon someone else or on outside help in your work for me. Many of you are ready to work Many of you are ready to work for me 100%. Yet because some of you are poor and have families, you cannot devote your time and means for my work. But why then work beyond your means? When the worker depends upon anyone or anything, the work suffers. Therefore, do as much as you can, 
but do it honestly. Thirdly, if money is collected for the work in the name of the divine cause and spent wrongly and without being accounted for, then all work in my name must be stopped immediately by the so-called workers. Even one penny extracted in my name without true foundation is dishonesty and will be the cause of millions of rebirths. And for one cent taken from others by such false pretensions, one dies a million deaths. Therefore, let honesty in work prevail. Fourthly, when you spread my eternal message of love to others, show them first that you really love me. Do not merely make them read my books and messages. Do more. Live such a life of love, sacrifice, forgiveness, and tolerance that others will automatically love me. If instead of doing the real work of love, you start doing organized propaganda work for me, it is absurd. I need no propaganda or publicity. I do not want propaganda and publicity, but I do want love and honesty. If you cannot live the life of love and honesty, you should stop working for me. I am quite capable of doing my universal work alone. Fifthly, I want you all to know for certain that Baba's work needs no money. In other ages, my work has been done without money. It can now be done without money. When money was in use, it was the cause of Judas's undoing and for which he sold me. It is natural for those workers who are poor to think that they must have money for Baba's work to spread far and wide. Oh, to spread far and wide his message of love. But from my point of view, to depend on money for Baba's work is work undone. To ask people to give money and then in return to propagate Baba's message of love is utter folly. Therefore, whether you have money or not, let it not affect my work. Money comes and goes, whereas my work is eternal. Money does not play any important role in my work for the divine cause. It is the life that you lead that plays the most important role. Hence, live such a life that others not only know you love me, but feel your love for me. Begin to live this life and let other workers for the divine cause follow suit. Let there be no compromise in this, no mixture of honesty and dishonesty. There can be no Baba without it. I am Baba. I know what I am. All those who love me and want to share my work can do so. Those who have money and can afford to go from place to place can spread my message of divine love in every distant nook and corner. Those who have a little money can go round their own town and district spreading my message of love and living the life of love by doing the service of God. And those who have no money or have families and little time can also do the work by guiding their own families and friends towards Baba's love. If you all love me even a little, I want your hearts towards each other to be clean and for you to forget your differences. Cleanse your hearts and live for Baba. Outwardly, you may establish hundreds of centers for Baba or none at all. 
That is your own responsibility. But bear in mind that for my work, it is not necessary to have centers or offices, nor the botheration of accounts and the collecting of money. Let Baba's love be the center, the office, the help, and the work. I want my lovers and workers to know that there is no greater Baba center than the heart of my lover. Those who truly love me are my centers in the world. Let each Baba lover, wherever he or she may be, be a Baba center, personified, radiating the eternal message of love divine, living the life of love, sacrifice, and honesty. When I say that each one of you be a Baba Center, it does not mean that each of you should work individually when you can work collectively in groups as Baba Centers. Neither does this mean that you should not work on your own. I have shown you how I desire the work to be done. It is for you to follow the method best suited to you. Thank you, Marian. Um... Miguel, could you unmute and continue, please? Let me now see how you love and work for Baba. I am everywhere. I am in you and see you. Do you share in my work in all sincerity? Be responsible for what you do and how you do it. I now will do my personally ordained work and break my silence very shortly. I love all. I am the Lord of love, the slave of my lovers, and, devote, and, devote, and devoted to my devotees. Although I do not perform miracles, I will give anything to whoever asks for it from the bottom of his heart. If I am Baba, everything is possible for me. Ask cool heartily, and you will get you will get it from me. But this I tell you too, that the one who asks for my love will be the chosen one. You who love me have expressed your love in a way that touches my heart, and I feel very happy. Yet, I have not known one who loves me as I will wish to be loved. There are about 220 men and women from the East and the West who have so completely and utterly surrendered to me that they will do nothing, that they will do anything I say. Whatever I order them to do, they will carry it out, even if it means being cut to pieces. To surrender is higher than to love, and paradoxical, as it may seem, to love me as I ought to be loved is impossible, yet to obey me is possible. Therefore, to say you love and yet not obey me will be hypocritical. The time is very near for the breaking of my silence. And then, within a short period, all will happen. My humiliation, my glorification, my manifestation, and the dropping of my body. All these will happen soon and within a short period. So, from this moment, love me more and more. I am everything that you take me to be. 
and I am also beyond everything. If your conscience says that Baba is the avatar, say it even if you are stunned for it. But if you feel he is not, then say that you feel Baba is not the avatar. Of myself, I say again and again, I am the ancient one, the highest of the high. If you had even the tiniest glimpse of my divinity, all doubts will vanish and love, real love, be established. Illusion has such a tight grip on you that you forget reality. Your life is but a shadow. The only reality is existence eternal, which is God. And there is a start. This address given by Baba at Raha Mundri on the 27th February 1954 was part of his mass darshan tour in Andhra state. In this address, readers will see that Baba has publicly identified himself with Jesus. Westerners who have had the privilege of accompanying the master on his travels in India, ha, have often been struck by the similarity of his life with that of the Gospels. Such unforgettable scenes have touched a core of memory in the hearts of those near him. Once more, we will remind those interested that the Abaratic state the Devaratic state of soul consciousness, that is to say, the avataric individuality of God, always manifests the one and only avatar or Brahma in different forms and under different names in order to sustain unity and duality at one and the same time. Whatever we might believe, it is very obvious to all that our world is now undergoing the most critical phase of its known history. And its trend seems to be towards an explosive climax. There is a theory that cosmic disturbances on a cosmic scale are caused by the planet being out of joint or equilibrium. So that it may have to make certain revolutions or movements to regain its lost balance or axis. This state of unbalance has been caused by a world lack of mental and spiritual poise. A disharmony not in accord with the divine pattern or rhythm of the universe, which is dependent on the vibra vib vibrational quality and power of the cosmic tone, which depends on the mind of man. Thus, we need a new vibration, a new turning of our consciousness. If we are to have another dispensation of the one and only truth that God is love. We now come to what we believe to be the most important of all the events connected with Meher Baba. At, at Menadgar, in the last days of September, 1954, a special gathering took place of men followers from all over India. And those who could come at such short notice from Europe, Australia, and America. 
on this momentous and final occasion, about 900 men were present. The address, as always by means of the letterboard, suggested that their beloved leader was making his farewell to the world stage and that the divine drama was drawing to its close. The scene was so affecting to many that many wept. The master gave a detailed description of the circumstances which would bring about his death, the destruction to follow, and the new dispensation to come. The master also made it very clear that when he breaks his silence and says the one word or sound vibration, he will lay the foundation for that which is to take place during the next 700 years. And that when he comes again as the avatar, 700 years hence, the evolution of consciousness will have reached a certain peak so that the materialistic tendencies of today will have disappeared and the world will be united in a real brotherhood of love and truth. <coughs> and this will be the long look, the long look for golden age. Uh, readers wish this a footnote. Richard's, readers wishing to wishing for details of Baba's address and events generally, which took place at Ahmed Nagar, can apply to Meher publications, King's Road, Ahmed Nagar, India, also The Awakener, Seattle, Washington, USA. Uh, thanks, Miguel. Well, I'll take a turn. Those who understand the esoteric significance of the Redeemer's death on the cross know that when the Christ cried out the creative word of God, the avataric spirit gushed forth in the Savior's blood, redeeming and regenerating the whole creation. Thus, the foundations for the Christian dispensation came into being and the chosen ones were illumined with the glory of the Father and every living creature partook of the divine upliftment. <clears throat> the old dispensation is nearing its end and a new dispensation again comes into being. The manifestation of the present avatar will redeem and regenerate our tired and tortured world. For God's recurring creative impulse will again repeat and assert the word. When Merbaba utters his dying cry, the word, the whole creation will move and the chosen ones will be illumined with the glory of the Father, self-realization, and every living creature will partake of the cosmic outpouring of the Spirit and all things shall be made new. And the heaven was removed as a scroll when it was rolled up and every mountain and island were removed out of their places. We now conclude this work with the avatar's description and the discourses of how divine love will, be, will gradually change the hearts of mankind and bring peace and goodwill to all. The new humanity will come into existence through a release of love in measureless abundance. And this release of love itself will come through the spiritual awakening brought about by the masters. Love cannot be born of mere determination through the exercise of the will, but one can at least be dutiful. One may through struggle and effort succeed in ensuring that this external action is in conformity with one's conception of what is right. 
But such action is spiritually barren because it lacks the inward beauty of spontaneous love. Love has to spring from within. It is in no way amenable to any form of inner or outer force. Love and coercion can never go together. But though love cannot be forced on anyone, it can be awakened in him through love itself. Love is essentially self-communicative. Those who do not have it, catch it from those who have. Those who get love from others cannot be its recipients without giving a response which in itself is of the nature of love. True love is unconquerable and irresistible and it goes on gathering power and spreading itself until eventually it transforms everyone whom it touches. Humanity will attain a new mode of being and life through the free and unhampered play of pure love from heart to heart. Uh, Gloria, could you unmute and continue? Quote, who needs recognize that there are no claims greater than the claim of universal divine life, which without deception includes everyone and everything. Love will not only establish peace, harmony, and happiness in social, national, and international spheres, but it will shine its own purity and beauty. End of quote. Quote, divine love is unassailable by the onslaughts of duality and is an expression of divinity itself. It is through divine love that the new humanity will learn the art of cooperation and harmonious life. It will be free itself from the tyranny of dead forms and release the spiritual life of spiritual wisdom. It will shed all illusions and be established in the truth. It will enjoy peace and abiding happiness. It will be initiated into the life of eternity." End quote. The seven is a title, The Seven Realities of Meher Baba's Teaching. Existence, love, sacrifice, renunciation, knowledge, control, and surrender. Meher Baba's teachings gives no importance to greed, dogma, caste systems, and the performance of religious ceremonies and rites, but to the understanding of the following seven realities. First, the only capital real existence is that of the one and only God who is the self in every finite self. Second, the only capital real love is the love for this infinity God, which arouses an intense longing to see, know, and become one with his truth God. Third, the only real Capitals. The only real sacrifice is that in which, in pursuance of this law, all things, body, mind, position, welfare, and even life itself are sacrificed. Are sacrificed. For the only capitals, real renunciation, is that which abandons, even in the midst of worldly duties, all selfish thoughts and desires. Fifth. The only capitals, real knowledge, is the knowledge that God is the inner dweller in good people and so-called bad, in saint and so-called sinner. This knowledge requires you to help all equally as circumstance demand without expectation of reward. And when compelled to take part in a dispute, to act without the slightest trace of enmity or hatred to try to make others happy with brotherly or sisterly feeling for each one, to harm no one in thought, word, or deed, not even those who, who harm you. Sixth, the only capital's real control is the discipline of the sense from indulgence in low desires, which alone ensures 
absolute purity of character. Seven, the only capital's real surrender is that in which the poise is undisturbed by an any adverse circumstance and the individual amidst every kind of hardship is resigned with perfect calm to the will of God. Uh, th thanks, Gloria. Uh, Marianne, could you uh, unmute and continue that? Appendix, preface, Dr. F.C. Coney Bear, M.A., Fellow of University College, Oxford. Although my father gave the book, Myth, Magic, and Morals, to the rationalist press, I feel it is expedient to quote the following words from the French biography of my father by Louise Maurice, compiled after my father's death, which took place in 1924, page 304. And this is quoting. Messrs. Watts and Company are the publishers of the books which issue from the Rationalist Press Association. It was fitting that they should become the publishers of the books which deny the historical existence of our Lord. They publish Mr. J. M. Robertson's two books, Pagan Christ and Christianity and Mythology. They publish Mr. W. B. Smith's Eke Deus, I think it's Eke or Esse, Esse Deus. And they publish the English translation of Witnesses to the Historicity of Jesus by Professor Arthur Drews. It does not seem so fitting that Messrs. Watts should publish a book by Dr. F. C. Coney Bear. It is true that Dr. Coney Bear is radical, as radical a critic as it is possible for a scholar to be, but then he is a scholar. The other men whose books Messrs. Watts publish are not. When his Myth, Magic, and Morals appeared in the same advertisement as the books of Mr. J.M. Robertson and the rest, it was understood that Dr. Coney Bear, Honorary Fellow of University College, Oxford, Honorary LLD of the University of St. Andrews, Honorary Doctor of Theology of Gießen, member of the British Academy and member of the Armenian Academy of Venice, etc., had gone over to the materialists and for the sake of companionship in his utter radicalism, had cast in his lot with the unlearned and the ignorant who belonged to the Rationalist Press Association. But Messrs. Watts have just published another book by Dr. Coney Bear. Its title is The Historical Christ, Paren 3S 6D net, close Paren. Dr. Coney Bear is not comfortable in his present company. In this book, he turns upon the three men who have obtained some glory by denying the historical existence of Jesus, Mr. J.M. Robertson, Dr. Andrew Drews, and Professor W.B. Smith, and makes an exposure of their ignorance and incompetence, the like of which has not been seen in our day. Close quote. Undoubtedly, my father, with his strong historical sense, saw clearly that the Jesuits and the Christists could not have any ob object in hoaxing their own and all subsequent generations 
and in building up a lasting cult and church on what they knew to be fables. It is interesting that he applied an equally unprejudiced acumen to his defense of the historical Christ, as he did to his general attack on Orthodox Christianity in Myth, Magic, and Morals. Segun, or Universal Mind, Introduction, page four. The oversoul and the universal mind carry two different meanings. It must be understood that Western terminology is a makeshift since the dynamics of divinity is an infinitely complex subject. And without a knowledge of Sanskrit and also of Sufism and Vedanta, it is almost impossible to explain many terms as we have no appropriate words in the English language or in any Western language. This subject is practically unknown in the West due to Christianity having been an entirely Western religion under the charge of Rome. Therefore, Christian mysticism is cloudy instead of clear, and each writer makes his own terminology applicable to what he wishes to express. Unlike Vedantic and Sufi terms that are generally accepted to carry particular meanings or fixed ideas, words have to be coined in English, which add to the confusion of our thinking. It is therefore important for writers to adhere to particular words for particular ideas. But in many cases, they are obliged to use the Sufi or Vedantic term. Thanks, Marian. Uh, Miguel, could you unmute and continue? One who becomes one with the other soul is a perfect one, but merely as such. He has nothing to do with the universal mind or with anything else, save perfection. Allí, for example, God consciousness. For the limited mind has been transformed into the unlimited self, that is the divine self. A perfect one who is able to return to normal human consciousness with divine consciousness has the universal mind, which always remains with him till he leaves his body. In this state of superconsciousness, he is a perfect master or sadguru. It should be understood that the majority of perfect ones are not perfect masters, because many perfect ones do not retain the universal mind and are therefore unconscious of creation the gross physical or universe, close parent. There are no end of categorical statements on these points in Sufi and Vedantic literature. And Eastern scholars with an interest in Eastern mysticism will enter into endless arguments on this subject so long as they only understand through the intellect and are not associated with a perfect master. When consciousness of duality, in parents, namely, namely creation, is achieved in addition to consciousness of the divine state, the illusory nature of the gross or creation consciousness is never lost sight of by a master. The uh, quote-unquote individuality of a perfect master or perfect one rests for all time in God realization or God consciousness, which is one and the same thing. But the personality of a perfect master depends upon the universal mind. That is to say, 
the individuality of God, I am God, plus the personality of in quotes, I am Jesus, or in quotes, I am Buddha, means the Christ consciousness. But there again, it must be remembered that God consciousness is not Christ consciousness. When a master drops his body, he drops his connection with the universal mind. Thus, he ceases to be in quotes, I am Jesus, or in quotes, I am Buddha, but continues to remain forever, quote, unquote, I am God. This happens after the death of a perfect master, for he again becomes only himself in God, the other soul. And as he has given up the universal mind, he remains unconscious of the world, which is, as always, Maya, until such time as he again takes the gross form in another incarnation on Earth. Uh, open parent, it should be remember that he will be born as ever, like an ordinary mortal, until such time as he, as he meets a perfect master who will give him God realization, close parents. Throughout the centuries, many have claimed to have seen Jesus, the Virgin and other great spiritual beings, but such figures are within Maya and therefore in quotes, thought forms. Nevertheless, they play a very important role for the spiritual work of the world. From the point of view of truth and nothing but truth, the universal mind is of importance only so long as our ignorance subsists. It is only from the viewpoint of our ignorance that the universal mind is of prime importance. In other words, if man is not completely conscious God, or if God is not completely conscious man, both states are of no use to us in our own self-realization. Thank you, Miguel. Uh, we'll go to here and pick up uh, next time on top of page 239. Hello.